Thanks, Robert. I'm Greg Albo uh, from York University uh, and one of the co-editors of the Socialist Register, which is hosting uh, tonight's talk uh, with uh, the Center for Social Justice, Socialist Project, uh, uh, LAPS at York University, uh, and uh, the Workers' Assembly. Uh, tonight's talk is on Europe's crisis and the rise of the right challenges for the left. Uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Beit Zetun again for hosting us, as they have been a lot over the last few years, and particularly over uh, this winter. Uh, it's been, uh, Beit Zetun's been a, a terrific meeting place for all of us on the left in Canada, uh, particularly in relationship to Palestinian solidarity work, but a whole range of issues. Uh, it's just been a, a, an amazing resource and uh, it really needs uh, uh, your support and sponsorship uh, through purchasing some of the goods and so on that they have on sale here uh, and just coming out to the events. Uh, like uh, uh, Beit Zetun, Toronto has always been a historical meeting place of the Aboriginal peoples of this area, the Anishabi, the Huron Wendat, the, the Seneca. And this still remains a contested territory uh, through land claims uh, uh, through of the Mississauga of the New Credit, and we thank them for our ability to meet here. Tonight's uh, talk uh, on uh, the crisis in Europe and the rise of the right is uh, very important. Uh, by some counts, we are now in the eighth year of the economic crisis that broke out in 2008. Uh, many of the contradictions from this crisis continue to compound and take all kinds of uh, uh, new twists uh, and uh, forms of political polarization in Europe. Uh, just today, uh, the talks of the new uh, over debt with, of, the, of the new government, this new Syriza government in Greece uh, broke down with uh, the European Union and the European Central Bank, uh, which is just one feature of the political polarization that is occurring. Particularly, one would say that the polarization has been especially on the political right. With uh, uh, the government, uh, with the European Union uh, elections in the, in the fall, uh, uh, having an electoral breakthrough for a range of political parties on the hard right, uh, they are just uh, one facet of, of that, because uh, there's been a lot of other breakthroughs occurring in different forms at the national level. Notably, of course, is the rise of the National Front in, the, in France to the lead in the polls in, in, in terms of electoral support at this point in time. But that is just the case of, of, of many countries in Hungary, uh, Denmark, uh, Netherlands, uh, uh, Britain, and so on. There's been all kinds of breakthroughs for the right. This, is, of course, is occurring in Europe, but Europe isn't isolated from these new hard right developments either. Uh, the election of the BGP in India is another example. Uh, the militarist turn that is occurring uh, under the Abe government in Japan is another example. Uh, the fundamentalist forces uh, still sweeping across uh, uh, the Middle East. Uh, the political forces in conflict right now in, in the Ukraine between Russia uh, and the Ukraine government are also examples of hard right forces in power, uh, and so on. So it's important that we take a serious look at these issues uh, of the right, uh, assess its, its uh, balance of forces, uh, look at where it's penetrating state institutions, try to uncover its various forms today, uh, its ethnic, racial uh, dynamics, and so on. Uh, and particularly, the, the subtitle of, of the discussion, the challenges for the left, is absolutely important too. How do we figure out to res how to respond to this? We are lucky uh, to have a range of guests in, in, in uh, Toronto uh, for the next few days and to be able to speak to us tonight. Uh, they are part of a workshop that the Socialist Register is holding on this question uh, for the, new, the next year's volume. This year's volume, Transforming Classes, uh, uh, takes up some of these issues. Uh, notably, a remarkable essay uh, by Achan Venag on the, on the new BJP government in, in India. And we're going to sustain some of that analysis uh, uh, over the coming issues, uh, the coming volume. Um, so we have a range of great speakers here, uh, some of the most important and insightful commentators on, on the political right in Europe and, uh, and challenges for the left uh, on both counts. Um, with apologies, uh, Richard Seymour is not able to make it today. 
Uh, his plane had problems leaving Heathrow in the weather turmoil, and he's holed up exhausted, he says, and so he's not able to make it today. But uh, in any case, we have some fantastic speeches. We'll be led off by Jeff Ely, a historian from uh, the European Michigan, uh, probably the foremost, one of the foremost, or the foremost writer on, on fascism uh, in, in Europe, and particularly in Germany, and well known for those, those of us not uh, studying fascism directly for his uh, remarkable book, Forging Democracy, uh, a magnificent study of the history of the left in Europe. So we're going to turn it over to the panelists to begin a discussion on these issues, and Jeff is going to kick us off. I'm sort of seeing my um, contribution tonight in terms of um, providing some historical depth of context for understanding fascism. Uh, a, a, a couple of uh, summers ago, I published a, a book called Nazism as Fascism, um, and the purpose of, of of doing that was really to try and put um, what I learned as a German historian um, at the service of contemporary uh, left political discussion, because it seems to me that um, in dangerous times where historical analogies and historical metaphors are reached for incredibly easily, it's extremely important to uh, do that responsibly and in ways that are really going to help. So it seems to me that, 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 um, that uh, the history of fascism uh, is uh, really useful knowledge in those, uh, those uh, senses. And I'm, I'm going to try and be uh, fairly brief, although you know, whenever I depart from the text, <laughs> It usually takes much, much longer, so we'll, but I'll, I'll, I'll certainly try. So I'm going to begin with an aphorism um, that Zizek recently has been adapting from Walter Benjamin, namely, uh, quote, every fascism is an index of a failed revolution. Every fascism is an index of a failed revolution. And then here's another voice, actually from uh, 1923, German communist Clara Zetkin, um, for whom fascism was the proletariat's punishment for not taking the revolutionary road. Okay? And after all, 1923, this is six years after the Bolshevik Revolution, at, in, in the aftermath of the defeat of revolutionary initiatives in Germany um, under circumstances of effective civil war. So, and it's in the immediate aftermath of the failed uh, uprising in uh, Hamburg in October 1923, and uh, the uh, uh, collapse and suppression of a united left coalition government in Saxony. So in other words, there's a kind of dramatic um, charge to Setkin's statement. So fascism, and of course it's interesting she's talking about fascism already in 1923 rather than 1933. That's important to what I can say later in the Q&A if, um, if it's uh, useful. In 1923 then, fascism was the proletariat's punishment for not taking the revolutionary road. Now these are very pregnant and, uh, and arresting phrases, it seems to me. But there's a dangerous slide involved here, um, from the, uh, and the slide is from the conviction that fascism's possibility was inscribed by the outcome of a prior revolutionary crisis, that the explanation for fascism, so its political intelligibility, what, what made it understandable, was linked to the form of the crisis that produced it. That's a slide from that insight toward uh, the classical Marxist belief in the causal primacy of class and of class political agency. <coughs> now, I'm not 
I don't want to be mis misunderstood here. I'm not discarding class remotely as a conceptual, as a theoretical uh, ground. It seems to me that if we're to understand where fascism, what produces fascism, where fascism comes from, we need to establish some explanatory distance from that ground of, uh, of uh, class <coughs> political analysis. Um, and I want you to keep that in mind as I'm developing these points. Now I'm going to make four points. And the first, I've, I've already slightly uh, anticipated, and, and it's a strong thesis, and I, I'd be really happy to say more about it later, and I'm going to loop back to it for the, the fourth of my points, too. So first, you know, and German historians, in order to make sense of Nazism, and I think Italian historians vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Italian fascism, too, have had a long-standing tendency to reach back into the 19th century to look for explanations for why German histories seem to have diverged from the history of the West, i.e. Britain and France, uh, with the, the uh, Nazi seizure of power. Okay? So there's a kind of uh, uh, a reflex towards deep cultural explanations. What made Germany different in these, in these ways? Okay? So my first point is a very strong thesis, and I really spent my career as a German historian arguing against what I just alluded to. <laughs> Rather than reaching for deep cultural explanations or structural theories of political backwardness, you know, Barrington Moore, for instance, I mean, these are the, the, the uh, complementary strategies that I think um, dominated understanding of this question until uh, more recently. Rather than reaching for deep cultural explanations or structural theories of political backwardness in order to explain fascism, the best way to begin requires theorizing fascism in terms of the crisis that produce it, produces it. Okay? Or produced it and can still produce it. Theorizing fascism in terms of the crisis that produced it. What is the nature of the fascism producing crisis is, you know, the primary question for me. Not, you know, did Germany have a failed bourgeois revolution in 1848, for example. Okay? And I'm going to come back to this question of the character of the crisis for my fourth point. Secondly... Among fascism's elements, and it's a, com you know, it's a complex political formation, okay? so it's a lot more than this, but this, this seems to me to be uh, most important. <coughs> Among fascism's elements, the most decisive was the unprecedented recourse to shockingly unfettered political violence, to repressive and coercive forms of rule, to guns rather than words, to beating up one's opponents rather than denouncing them from the speaker's platform, killing socialists rather than just arguing with them, or at most legally and practically restricting their rights, was the key change after 1918. So you no longer argue with your opponents in an election or from the speaker's podium, you beat them up and you kill them. Well, this is really new, okay, in 1918 and after. Before 1914, attacks on democracy, the attack on democracy, you know, which was still very much a work in progress in Europe before 1914, before 1914, attacks on democracy unfolded within normative, legal, and political contexts that were gradually bringing extra-democratic violence under constraint. And it was this political culture of ritualized and respectful proceduralism that the First World War and its aftermath uh, disordered. 
This was the history of cumulative progressivism that fascists violently disavowed. It was the practical, consensual ground of political civility that fascists in Italy and Germany brazenly deserted. So for me, this is the crucial break. This is the Civilizationsbruch, okay, that German historians have you know, like to uh, use in order to characterize the Holocaust, okay? For me, this is the real breach in 1918, from, uh, from which everything else follows. It's the departure from the gradually accumulating norms of political civility, okay? So I spent most of my time, actually, on this second point, because I think it's, it's you know, we don't get anywhere unless we understand this, uh, this breach, okay? So thirdly, another tendency on the part of uh, historians of Nazism, and I think of, of Italian fascism too, especially of Nazism, and I think we've kind of killed this one now, but until the last 20 years or so, uh, historians of Nazism uh, still tended to reach for this uh, argumentation of anti-modernism. Okay? So it's about, you know, Nazism is about backwardness, irrationalism, uh, an act, it's an atavism, you know, whether in relation to anti-Semitism or any uh, other aspect of uh, Nazism. That, again, was a, a, a very familiar reflex. Well, for me, this is the third point, fascism was a modernism. Now, uh, although he's, you know, slightly, uh, I think he's kind of gone off the derrick during the last 15 years, and he's extremely uh, kind of um, unpredictable and uh, opinionated, Roger Griffin, uh, has done most to get this properly instated in our understanding of fascism and I think also of Nazism. In you know, 1991 he published this book, The Nature of Fascism, uh, which was uh, um, a, a, a really crucial uh, intervention in getting historians to think more seriously about fascism again. And he's gone on publishing extremely important works including fascism and uh, modernism in uh, 2007. So after Griffin, we can see fascism, and this is a quote, as an intensely politicized form of the modernist revolt against decadence that saw culture as a site of total social regeneration. And in Griffin's words, Quote, fascism is a form of programmatic modernism that seeks, to con that seeks to conquer political power in order to realize a totalizing vision of national or ethnic rebirth. Its ultimate end is to overcome the decadence that has destroyed a sense of communal belonging and drained modernity of meaning and transcendence and usher in a new era of cultural homogeneity and health. And I, 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 he's persuaded me over the last 25 years that this is a really important place to begin understanding fascist ideology in the early 20th century from. Okay? Obviously now it's going to look different, but you know, in the context of the First World War in the 1920s, this idea of cultural regeneration and cultural rebirth in modernist, in modernist terms, is, is uh, crucial. And I go further than that, and here I think people like uh, Sigmund Bauman and others who have written about the Holocaust, Holocaust and modernity uh, are also uh, extremely uh, important and influential. Because, for me, fascism entails, especially in its German version, after 1933, an intensifying of modernist governmentality. And I can say more about that, what I mean by this later. I'm, I'm using it in a very uh, self-consciously post-Foucauldian sense. 
<coughs> so it's, it's in the biopolitical sense in relation to population policy. And by modernist governmentality here, I mean the hubris of early 20th century planning utopias of social reconstruction. I mean the new ways of constructing, imagining, visualizing, quantifying, regulating, policing, improving, comprehensively redesigning, and perhaps transforming the social, the social sphere or society, and of course fascism in its German version, in its Nazi version, was about the transformation of the social around the category of race. Okay? And this is a modernist project, it's not some atavistic kind of uh, return to 19th century conceptions of uh, society. That's my third point, fascism was a, was a modernism. Um, Lastly, fourthly, the fascism <laughs> producing crisis. So what is the crisis that produces fascism? And I, I still actually find the discussions that Pulancas initiated in the 1970s extremely uh, helpful in, in this way. It's a really good place to begin, in my view. It seems to me that, that fascis the fascism producing crisis is one in which two things happen. Firstly, um, is there's a crisis of representation, so it becomes impossible to continue building the kind of stable governing coalitions, whether in relation to the party political dynamics, or in relation to the state institutional complex, or in relation to the constitution per se. It becomes impossible to build, to continue building the stable coalitioning processes that allow uh, uh, government to be conducted, but especially under circumstances of economic crisis. Okay. There's a breakdown. Okay. The political process breaks down. Secondly, there's a crisis of uh, legitimacy or consent or hegemony. Okay. So simultaneously, the existing political institutions lose their credible purchase on popular consent. Okay? Now we can find versions of crises of that kind quite frequently, but when they occur in an extreme form together, that's the, cri that's the kind of crisis, it seems to me, in which extremely dangerous things start to happen. Now I've, I've been talking about uh, the early 20th century in Europe, but part of my purpose in building up a, 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 an argument of this kind is to create the ground from which a portable concept of fascism can be abstracted that we can then take to other times and places, including today. Okay? And it seems to me if we take this idea of the fascism producing crisis, the kind of crisis that produces fascism, and we look at the contemporary United States and some other locations, we can see very much that kind of breakdown occurring. Okay. The polity is broken. Okay. It doesn't function anymore. Crisis of representation. But there's a, a, an extreme dissolution of popular uh, consent as well popular belief in the system, okay? And when those two things occur together, it's extremely um, dangerous. And that's, I guess, where I'll... <laughs> Perfect.